Uh, you'll need your Bible out this morning. We'll be in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 13. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. We've supplied one for you there in the pew rack in front of you. Uh, you are welcome to take that home with you if you don't have your own copy of the Scripture. Or if you know someone uh, who needs one, feel free to take that with you. Uh, we'll be sure to replace it this week. Now, last week, if you weren't here, the topic or the title of the message was how to properly evaluate Christians. All right, so you, you really missed your opportunity. Right now, you're already thinking, I know you're thinking, man, there's a couple of Christians in my life. I'd really like to know how to properly evaluate and judge their Christianity. So what you want to do, jump onto our website, watch last week's uh, message, and that'll give you all the information you need to know on how to properly judge and evaluate the Christian life of others. I'll give you the answer so, so you don't think I'm totally off base. The answer was, wait for Jesus, find out what he says, and say that you agree with him. That was really, at the end of the day, that was the message. Uh, now, it took us 45 minutes to get there, but that was uh, the message last week. And this week, uh, the message is going to be, the title is, What Good Christians Look Like. What Good Christians Look Like. Now, I have to remind you that oftentimes, I've told this before, I've told you this before, and I've been reminded of it, not everybody is really sensitive to the humor we call sarcasm. And that's what these titles are. And I just want to lay that out there so somebody's like, well, you can't judge Christians. Of course you can't, but we use sarcasm. And I'm not doing this uh, without uh, some basis. The reason I'm using some sarcasm, and, and the Christian way of saying sarcasm is saying irony. Uh, that's the Christian version of sarcasm is I'm just being ironic. Um, so you can say it that way. It's because the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 is, is, is profoundly ironic and sarcastic because he's trying to make a point and make a point rather, well, pointedly. And he's using some sarcasm. So I, I, print, I think I might have referred to this last week, but I found it. So just read along with me. Comic strip. You can't read it. It's not on the screen. I'd be breaking like 17 copyright laws if I put it on the screen. So... Dilbert, he's talking to his dog, Dogbert. Just suspend reality for a minute. He's talking to his dog, all right? And he says this, listen, Dogbert, I've been considering acupuncture as a way to relieve stress. And Dogbert replies to Dilbert, so the theory here is, Dilbert, that sticking large needles into your body will help you relax. And Dilbert replies to Dogbert, well, it sounds silly when you say it that way. And Dogbert's reply, well, sometimes sarcasm helps us think more clearly. <laughs> so that's what the Apostle Paul is doing with us this morning, is he's using some irony to help us think more clearly. What do good Christians look like? And Paul is going to try and help shatter our notions on what we think a good Christian ought to look like, and he's going to use uh, some irony and hopefully a little bit of humor uh, to, to, to do that. Read with me along again the verse, two verses of this section, verses 6 and 7. Paul says this, Brothers, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, Do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? See, what happened is the Apostle Paul, he spent about 18 months in the city of Corinth, and he had a very fruitful ministry there. When he showed up there, there was no Christians. When he left 18 months later, there was the church at Corinth. And Paul had a very simple message. It was Jesus crucified. Jesus crucified. Put on repeat, 18 months later, there's a church saved because of the powerful work of Jesus crucified and the Holy Spirit convicting those people that they needed to trust Jesus. Now, this church has continued on. Paul has left, and now this church has grown and matured to some degree. And, and now they've realized that there are other people out there besides Paul, and one in particular is a guy named Apollos. Apollos was from the city of Alexandria, which is in northern Africa. The city of Alexandria is very learned. If you go to Alexandria, it means you're probably a smart guy. And Apollos was. And Apollos, though, had, had, had no ill will towards Paul. And in fact, Apollos' ministry was from the Holy Spirit, and he was, he's, throughout the New Testament, conveyed as someone who just was dedicated to preaching the gospel, but Apollos was a gifted speaker and orator. He was able to, to eat, talk about things, and, and people are, wow, this guy is interesting. Uh, he's the kind of person he could talk for 20 minutes about nothing, and you would say, wow, that was amazing. 
And so he came and he ministered in Corinth. And all of a sudden, the people in Corinth said, now this guy, this is what we need. Paul, Paul he's kind of lame. All he does is talk about Jesus. There's more interesting and complicated and, and nuanced theologies that we want to explore. And Apollos, really, he's such a good speaker that he can talk about anything, and it's fun to listen to. And so they've started saying, we don't need Apostle Paul. We don't care about the Apostle Paul. We want some, some nice, complicated theology so we can brag to our other Christian friends about how smart we are, how we can parse verbs and tell you how many angels dance on the head of a pen and and then the Baptists say, the angels aren't dancing, they're praying. And Anyway, this is where they were. They were really offended with Paul because he was so simple. All he talked about was Jesus and Jesus crucified. In fact, that's what Paul says earlier in 1 Corinthians. See, I, I committed my, my mind when I came to you, the only thing I would know is Jesus and him crucified. And so Paul is now saying to them, why do you want to take pride in what you know? Why do you now want to take pride in being able to understand and comprehend and talk like Apollos versus Paul? And that's what he says at the, the end of verse 6. That's really his point here at the beginning. He says, is this, he says, you take, do not take pride in one man over and against another. He says, you, you shouldn't do that. Say, I'm, I, I love Apollos because he's complicated and he talks well. Good. Well, one of those two. And, and, and Paul is so simple. He, he, he doesn't talk about things that are tickling our ears and ideas we hadn't heard before. And so they're taking pride in Apollos over the Apostle Paul. And Paul says this quite frankly in verse 6. His point in verse 6 is you should not take pride in one person over another. And I mean, we do this. We, we talk about people we like. You know, some of us, we love to listen to Chuck Swindoll and... Uh, uh, or Charles Swindoll, I should say. I don't go by him and I are on a first name basis. I make him call me Pastor Spires. Um, or no, I love David Jeremiah. He's the bee's knees. Or uh, John MacArthur, whoever kind of turns your crazy. Man, I wish, you know, this is what every preacher should be like. This is what every speaker or author ought to be like. And the Apostle Paul says, that is so ridiculous. It is so ridiculous to pick teams based on people. He says, there's one team, it's Team Jesus, and that's all I'm going to talk about. And so he just decides to keep it really simple, and he says this, look, why would you take pride over one man over another? Verse 7, he has some rhetorical questions. He says, who makes you different than anyone else? Well, answer it. Who makes you different than anyone else? Jesus. He is the only one who can take you from death into life. He is the only one who can get rid of your sin and give you righteousness. He is the only one who can guarantee you a purpose in his kingdom and take you out of a life of hopelessness. He is the only one that can assure you that your life here has a better future in eternity. He is the only one that matters to anyone. Whether we believe it or not, he is the only one that matters to anyone. I was a, at a concert uh, with a youth group over the weekend, and I heard somebody say this. I can't remember who they were talking about, but they said, this person is truly one of the heroes of the kingdom. And I know what they're saying. They're talking about this person who demonstrated some faithfulness. And so I don't have a problem with using that term. But in my mind, I thought, no, there's really only one hero. I mean, there really is only one. There, is, there isn't heroes. There's one hero. And anything you and I might be is always in Christ. Nobody gets to make a claim to fame. He says, everything you have, you were given. What does he mean by everything you have, you have received? What he's meaning is you didn't earn it. If you have life in Christ, you did not earn it. If you have a maturity in Christ, you didn't earn it. If you have faithfulness in Christ, you didn't earn it. He says, everything you have, you were given. It wasn't earned, it wasn't deserved, and it certainly isn't able to be protected. Everything you have, both spiritually in Christ and in the world uh, that we live in, that he has blessed us with. He says, if you, did, if you received it, why do, if you were given it, why do you boast as though you earned it, is what he says. See, I'm going to talk about how spiritual I am. And Paul is saying, why would you talk about how spiritual you are? You didn't do anything. Jesus did all of it start to finish. See, I think our habit a lot of times as Christians is say, Jesus saved me, and I'm responsible for the rest of my life. Jesus saved me, so I'm going to spend my, the rest of my life trying to keep up. So if I do good things... Yea, for me. If I do bad things, well, I'm back to trusting Jesus. But what Paul says, 
Everything you have was given, was granted, from your spiritual life to your life in this world. So everything was given to us, every blessing we have, our material blessings, our family, our friends. Everything we have was given to us. Why do we act like we've earned it? All we have, we were given. A good exa- the best example I can think of in the Bible of the Christian life, the best example I can think of in the Bible of the Christian life is the two thieves hanging on the cross next to Jesus. Do you remember these guys? I don't know their names. I think the early church gave them names, but I don't know what they were. So one guy, they're both at the beginning, when Jesus is on the cross, they're both at the beginning hurling insults at Jesus, right? I don't know if you remember the story, but they're both insulting Jesus, joining the crowd with him, saying, with them, saying, hey, if, you, if you're God, why don't you just get yourself down? You know, they're hurling insults at him. But then at some point, during the period of time they're all on the, on the crosses there, one of the, the other thief says to, to the remaining one, he says, listen, we're here because we're criminals. We ought to be on these crosses. He didn't do anything wrong. So they're declaring out loud the righteousness of Christ. Declaring out loud that Jesus did not deserve to be on the cross. Declaring out loud his own need to be on a cross. What do we call that? I admit I'm a sinner. And so he does that. Good time to do that is just before you die, right? So he admits, I am a sinner. I need him. And so he turns to Jesus and declares a prayer, so to speak, of need. And he turns to Jesus, today, remember me in your kingdom. Just remember me. He doesn't make a claim that he's learned some fantastic knowledge or that he has any claim to righteousness. He's hanging on a cross. And he turns to Jesus, which would be hard to do. He turns to him and says, remember me today. And what does Jesus say to him? Well, if you live long enough and establish that you're a faithful uh, believer and you give enough money to the local synagogue, right? He says, no, you're in. And this guy has a short Christian life. It was longer than Jesus's because Jesus died and later they had to come through and break the legs of the thieves. But this is, see, we seem to think that we get saved and then somehow later on, like we dress ourselves up like good Christians or something. That's the, that is it. The rest of our life we live, remember the verse we read with those being baptized, I am crucified with Christ. Our life is lived at Calvary, not bearing our sin, but identifying ourselves with the crucified Christ. We spend our whole life doing that. We don't go to the cross to get saved and spend the rest of our life seeing how far we can get from it. We go to the cross to get saved and we stay there as Christians, always coming back to the cross because that is the place we find Christ paying for our sins. So this is the Christian life. is the thief hanging on the cross next to Jesus. Some of you are wondering why you came to church today. It's depressing. Listen, I've got news for you. It's going to get worse. We're not even halfway through. This is, one of those cha- this is one of those passages in the Bible we would skip, except that we, we've kind of committed to kind of work our way through Scripture's holy. So this is one of those places that we would skip if we could. It's going to get ugly. What do good Christians look like? First of all, we have to realize everything we have, we were given. Everything we have, we were given. There is not a thing you have in your Christian life or your personal life that God did not personally decide to provide for you. There is not a single thing you have that you earned. And I realize I'm talking to a group of Americans, and that flies in the face of our culture, but this is just what he's saying here. There isn't a thing you have from your spiritual journey with Christ to your bank account that God did not decide beforehand, I'm going to give this to you. And Paul is saying, why would we boast in anything if everything we have was granted, not earned or deserved? So what do good Christians look like? First principle is everything we have, we were given. Second principle is kind of a story that Paul tells, and I'm going to, I put it this way, the tale of two Christians. Tale of two Christians, and Paul is going to compare himself to the believers in Corinth. And, and here in verses 8, 9, and 10, he lists off some things that he says about the believers in Corinth. And this is the part where, just so you know, the irony comes in. Paul is being ironic. He's trying to make fun of them a little bit. Here's some of the words I pulled out here that he describes the believers in Corinth. You are rich. And in fact, they were. There are many in their, in their fellowship that were very wealthy. Not everybody in the church was wealthy, but we know from later on in the book that there were many who were very wealthy. 
He says, you are rich, you are kings, you are wise, you are strong, you are honored. These are all things he's saying about the the believers in Corinth. And this is how Paul describes himself. He says, I am a spectacle, and not the good kind. Not the bear juggling on a unicycle kind of spectacle, which is fun to watch. This is the bad kind of spectacle. The kind of spectacle where Rome would go and conquer an army and they would bring the prisoners of war as the last part of the parade, and they would be bound, and they would be naked. And they would be marched through the city. Paul says, I am a spectacle. Paul says, I, am con- I, I live as a condemned person. Paul says, I am a part of the procession, the humiliating procession. Paul calls himself foolish. Paul calls himself weak. Paul calls himself dishonored. And Paul is saying, look at these two Christians. One is rich, one is knowledgeable, one has authority, one has influence, has strength. The other one is humiliated, poor, homeless, and a spectacle. And he's comparing the two, and he's trying to say, this, these are, you're basing your entire Christian life on what you look like, Corinth. And Paul is saying, this is, this is what it really looks like. Because, see, we, we, we don't find this idea of strength, wisdom, knowledge, power, and influence when we're sitting at the cross, do we? It feels a little embarrassing to show up at the foot of the cross and say, God, look how rich I am, and he's on the cross kind of going, that's interesting, I guess. i got bigger, bigger things to worry about than how much money you have or how much power you have or how much of the Bible you know. And Paul is saying at the foot of the cross, all of that just falls away. It just doesn't matter. He says that we can look at our Christian life in a, in a couple of different ways. We can, we can look for strength and, and, and try to, to gird it up with, with knowledge and wisdom and power and influence and, and feel like we're doing all the right things. And, and he says, this, that's not the way my Christian life is. Paul says, I'm a, I'm a fool. I'm homeless. I'm, I'm naked. I'm embarrassed. I made a spectacle. And he says it worse than that. You know what else he says? God did this to me on purpose. This is what God intended for me. Already you have all you want, he says. Already you have become rich. You have become kings. And even that without us, how I wish you really had become kings so that we might be kings with you. For it seems to me that God has put us on apostles on displays at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe. Not just the world, but to the angelic beings. We are weak, but you are strong. We are, you are honored. We are dishonored. You are strong. What's ironic about all of this is everything Paul was saying was absolutely true. What's ironic about this, and this is what Paul is trying to tell them, is you have all this great stuff, and for some reason you think it matters. For some reason you've convinced yourself, believers, that how complicated your theological knowledge is that somehow that matters that that somehow having influence and power either in a church or in the community that 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 matters that having a, a a large bank account that somehow that is what matters and and paul is he's sort of making fun of them which is funny because all of these things that paul is talking about are things that we hold very dear to and I say we because I, you know, I grew up in the United States as well. As it turned out, I've lived my whole life here. This, when I read this, I say, Paul, you didn't, you didn't live in, in America. This, this is kind of like you know, apple pie, hot dogs, baseball. I mean, this is kind of our stuff, Paul. When we do stuff, we do it good. It looks good. We put a lot of shine on it. And Paul said, well, okay, it just doesn't matter. We, we lose context of what really matters you know, having, having lived in a place that God has blessed so greatly. I, I was watching the news last night, and a reporter was in the Philippines. As you may know, a large typhoon hit the Philippines. There are many, many people who died and are still today struggling. And he mentions, uh, he, he was kind of looking at this place where they were dispersing aid, rice and uh, high-protein biscuits or something and water. And he said, but there's a village uh, that they haven't got the aid to yet. And he said, these people spend all of their time, 24 hours a day, when they're not sleeping, I guess, 
and they just simply are working all their time to, to meet their basic needs. They, they just work sun up to sundown to try and make sure they have enough food for the day and that their basic needs have been met. And I, you know, I didn't laugh, but I thought that was funny. Why is that funny? Because that's been the condition of the humankind for most of history. It's only been in the last you know, 100 years or so that so many people could enjoy so much leisure. It really has been, for most of human history, that was what you did. You got up, and the first job of the day was figure out where you, what you're going to eat that day. You spend the day finding what you're going to eat, then you spend the day cooking what you're going to eat, and then you sit down and watch Oprah. No, I mean, it just didn't happen. <laughs> that was your whole day. Your whole day was planning for today and maybe having something squirreled away for tomorrow, but this idea of leisure time is a modern convenience. And so, so we, we look at what we have in these things are so important, we don't realize that so much of it doesn't matter. So much of it matters. Here in the United States, in the Western church, we, we are rich. The poorest of us are wealthy. Uh, we are knowledgeable. We have access to information like you would not believe, especially as it relates to the Bible. Uh, even if you don't own a Bible, you can go to the library for free and look up every version available online. You can look up commentaries online. You can look up sermons and listen to whoever you want. You know, we just have access at, to everything we might have, want, whether it be knowledge or information or wealth. And, and Paul is, is not saying that any of these things are evil. And I don't want you to hear me wrong. I certainly am not saying that. But what Paul is saying very loudly and what we have to come to terms with is none of these things are evil. Paul is just simply saying they just don't matter. If you have them, fantastic. You know, that's great. But if you don't, fantastic. They, they just don't matter, is what Paul is saying. And that's what he's telling the, the Corinthian believers. They're hanging their Christian hat on so many things that just don't matter. I mean, let's think about it this way. The last time something went really sideways on you, whether you lost a job, uh, whether someone in your family was ill, or, or you're walking through the house and you stepped on a Lego, is there anything worse? <laughs> Literally may not be anything worse. There are, there are uh, prisons that, that they scatter Legos on the floor. I'm kidding, they don't do that because it's cruel and unusual. <laughs> and what's the first thing you do when you lose a job or some, a bill comes in? Lord, what are you doing? I mean, because that's our response. Lord, what are you doing? And the Lord says, well, I'm doing my thing. But why do we get so upset when we lose our stuff, when we lose what we want? We, Paul just wants us to reorient our perspective around what God is doing and saying those things aren't bad they're also not good, and they just don't matter. Like I said, I would have skipped this if we could have. Just so you know, it's, it's going to get worse. <laughs> We're not even home yet. We haven't even got to the bad part. Not, I, don't, I mean that facetiously since it's Sarcasm Sunday. <laughs> okay, what do good Christians look like? First principle we need to know is, number one, is all you have you were given. All you have, you were given. So if you want to know what a good Christian looks like, the first thing we're going to have to have in mind is to know you didn't earn anything, whether it's spirituality, your Christianity, your salvation, your money, your family, whatever it is. Everything you have was granted to you by the grace of God. Secondly, what good Christians look like uh, is we need to look at the differences between two different folks. And Paul compares himself with the Corinthian believers. One is strong, wise, wealthy, has everything going for him. The other one is humiliated and naked publicly. And Paul is saying that's where you want to be. What do good Christians look like? I'm going to read these last three verses, uh, verses 11, 12, and 13. Paul describes his own life. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. I don't, think, I, I, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone say that that is their life verse. I mean, it's not one of those verses that feels good. It doesn't sit right with us. It's a, does the Bible really call Paul the, the scum of the earth? And what, what does he mean by that? What does that sound like? As he describes himself, does that bring anybody to mind? Does that sound kind of like how, how Jesus lived? Where foxes have nests or birds have nests and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head? 
See, what, what the Apostle Paul is just simply saying, he says, listen, to live a Christian life, I'm just going to live like Jesus did. Now, it doesn't mean he pursued uh, um, a vow of poverty or that he uh, went and got rid of all his money. There's other places in the Bible. He says, sometimes I've got more than enough. Other times I have nothing. All he's saying is he just doesn't hang his Christian hat on this stuff. He can be a maturing, growing follower of Jesus when everything in his world is going wrong. He just simply says, what, what does a good Christian look like? They look like Jesus. Uh, you can be a good Christian who looks like Jesus with a giant bank account, but you can also be a good Christian who looks like Jesus with an empty bank account in prison. The point is, he's saying we're looking at the wrong factors. We just look like Jesus wherever we might be with whatever he has granted to us. Nothing that we've earned, nothing that we've generated on our own. We just simply look like Jesus where he has put us. It's a life focused on the cross. It's not a life of going to the cross when I get saved and spending the rest of my life away from it. It's a life of saying, Jesus hung on the cross for me. I should have hung there with him. And I spend my life grateful for his humility. I want to look at just a couple of verses uh, in Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 7 through 11. Uh, This kind of gives us some insight into Paul's frame of mind because Paul also wrote the book of Philippians. And it says this, Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Did you hear what he said? He wants. I want to know Christ, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. I just want to live like Jesus did and Jesus suffered. That was just a part of his deal. And Paul is saying, I'm in. I I am so in with what Jesus is doing that I know that suffering is going to be a part of that. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul also describes Jesus' ministry. It says this this in Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. And he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So that's what Jesus does. He goes from heaven, creating the world, running the universe, hanging out with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And he says, I will take complete and total abject abject humiliation and dying on the cross for humans. And Paul just simply says, as a Christian, I'm in with what he's doing. I'll follow him. He's suffering. I'll suffer with him. Finally here, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39. I don't want to end on a downer, so... Hebrews 11, verse 39, not 10. <clears throat> Paul's just got done talking about all these other believers who also suffered quite a bit. Talked about people being sawn in half and going around in goat skins and um, wandering around in deserts and caves and holes in the ground and those sort of things. And this is how the author of Hebrews describes these folks. These all, those who came before us, were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So so what Paul is saying is, listen, a a life of suffering in Christ is not a hopeless life. It's just simply saying this, a life lived focused on the cross is one that has a hope staked or a hope anchored on an unseen eternity with Christ. It's simply a decision of which you would rather have. Do you want your glory here or do you want your glory with Christ later? 
And the Apostle Paul is saying, with eyes of faith, we can see that everything here is fading away. Why not stake our hope on what's coming later and is permanent? So a life lived focused on the cross is not a life lived of moping around, of woe is me. It's a life of hope because it says, I figured out how to get the best return on my suffering. It's, a, it's, a pretty, it's an eternal return. This is why I say Christians suffer, but we don't suffer stupidly. I'd get in trouble if my kids hear me say that word. We don't suffer stupidly. I'm going to put it this way. It's going to sound crass. Hear me right. Okay, don't hear me wrongly. We, we suffer because we know what's coming. We don't just suffer because we're gluttons for punishment. The suffering in the Christian life that Paul describes is a suffering that's filled with hope. It's filled with what we're looking forward to, and we stake our life on it. A willingness to suffer is only possible if we truly believe what's coming next. Everything in the book of Corinthians is staked on a hope of an eternity with God. If you don't believe in the resurrection or eternity with God, you will never be able to suffer well for Christ. Because our hope is not that we suffer and then there's a payoff next week. Our hope is we suffer, die, and go to heaven. Let me put it this way. There's a lot of churches nowadays, and I hope ours might be one of them in particular, who are saying, you know what, you know what church ought to be like? Church ought to be more like the church in Acts, right? Have you ever been to a church? They say, you know, the church is based on Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, right? I'm setting you up. You can tell. You're used to me, right? We want to be a church based on Acts. We say, we haven't come up with anything new. Church should be based. We should do things the same way that they did in the book of Acts. So let me read for you Acts chapter 4. Did I say Acts chapter 4? I was wrong. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold their possessions. Everyone gave to each other. It's like a party. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. We don't do that. It's a little weird, okay? They broke bread in their homes. We assume they also ate it. They didn't just break it and leave it. They praised God, enjoyed the favor with all the people, and guess what? The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We're like, man, let's do church like that, right? But then we fail to remember that Acts does not have two chapters. How many chapters does it have? It's got 28 of them. All right, so a couple of other excerpts. Uh, Acts 4, 29. Peter and John have just been scolded by the Sanhedrin, told to be quiet or they'll do mean things to them, and they could. They killed Jesus. The Lord then, so this was their prayer. Lord, consider your, the, their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. I always say this. You never pray for things. You do automatically. These were a couple of scaredy cat apostles who wanted some boldness. Lord, we are scared to death here. Okay, so you want to do church like, Acts, like the book of Acts? Then we'll do it scared. Praying to God every day for boldness because we're so scared that we're going to be uh, arrested. Uh, Acts chapter 5, it doesn't get any better. Verse 40, uh, he, he, that's one of the Sanhedrin, persuaded the other Sanhedrin members to not kill them. So they had called the apostles in and had them flogged. They told them not to talk about Jesus anymore. Good flogging ought to do it, right? The apostles left the Sanhedrin moping that Jesus had finally lost. It was a good effort. No, what's it say? The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering. They were pumped that they got to suffer knowing that one day there would be an eternal reward and they were looking forward to it. They weren't rejoicing because they're weird. Now, it is a little weird, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't hopeless suffering. It's, I just got flogged for Jesus and now one day there's going to be glory in him because of it. Nobody else is getting this opportunity right now is what they're saying. We got in at the ground floor. And we're getting flogged for Christ. Nobody at this point has ever been flogged for Christ besides Jesus. And they, they're ecstatic. They're looking forward to eternity and can't believe that they get to share in the suffering. Acts chapter 7. Stephen preaches a sermon. It was a great sermon. At the end of this sermon, he gave an invitation. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell on his knees and cried out while being stoned with rocks. Don't hear that wrong. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. He gives an altar call while getting stoned to death. Lord, don't hold this against them. May some of these people throwing rocks today get saved, Lord. 
Okay, that is, you don't, you don't just bear down and get through that kind of suffering. That kind of suffering is only endured with joy because he's staking his hope on an eternity that is sure. He believes heaven is coming, and so a stoning is not a big deal. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and everybody ran for their lives. Now, here's what I'm going to argue, is if we want to do church like they do in the book of Acts, we should read this verse. We should run our Christian life like we've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. Last cross-reference, and then we'll hopefully land this plane. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and what he means by that, since so many people have come before us and suffered and died for Jesus... Let us throw everything off that hinders and sin. So he tells you to throw off two things. What? Those things that hinder, that are perfectly fine, but they're holding you back, and sin. Throw off everything that easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. That sounds impossible. How do we do it? Hebrews 12, 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What does a good Christian life look like? It's, one spent, it's a life spent at the foot of the cross saying, I want to live like that because I have something better coming someday. A good Christian life is a life of willingness to endure whatever Jesus has for us because he endured everything the Father had for him. A good Christian life doesn't stake anything on this world. Everything we have in this world was given to us. Everything we have in the world can be taken away tomorrow. A good Christian life says, I choose the cross. I'll take my glory in eternity. I don't need it today. I choose the cross. I'll take my glory in eternity. Not only is that... um, Not only is that the right thing to do according to the Apostle Paul... It's also the smart thing to do. Glory here fades. Wealth here fades. Influence here fades. Love here fades. In eternity, everything we receive from Christ is forever. If you like good investment opportunities, there's one. Invest in glory. It will never fade. Jesus' glory will endure forever. What does a good Christian look like? It's one who spends their life at the foot of the cross saying, I'll take that and I'll take my glory with Jesus in heaven. God, you can take everything else, and that's fine. In fact, cool. Will you stand with me? So we close in prayer. We're going to sing one final song, and I just want to give you an opportunity to respond to what the Lord is doing in your heart. In a group of folks this size, there's a lot of different things that may be churning in your own mind. Primarily, one of the things most importantly is for you to assess between you and God uh, what you're staking your eternal future on. You staking it on your ability to do good things, uh, obey and be a good citizen and attend church? I don't know. But when I get to heaven, the only thing I'm staking my future on is Jesus died for me. So I got nothing else to offer. So if you can't think of a time in your life where you came to the Lord and said, finally, Lord, I agree with you. I'm not perfect. I'm broken. I need your help. The Bible simply says to put our faith in him and we can trust him with our eternal future. None are turned away who come to Christ in faith. None are turned away who come to Christ in faith. What the enemy would like to do is convince you that you're just too bad. But there is no too bad for Christ because his sacrifice on the cross was perfect And it was sufficient for all who would come to him. So if you're here today and you haven't put your faith in Christ, I would challenge you at this time, why don't you pray and put your faith in him? Just like that thief did. Lord, today, remember me in your kingdom. If you're here today and you're a Christian and you've been challenged today in your Christian walk to want to stake your hope, not on your ability to be a good Christian, but rather on the cross, then now's a great time to come to the Lord and just repent. Say, Lord, you take care of this. I'm done working so hard. Why don't you just take, take the reins here, you run this ship, and I'll just trust you with what you bring with me.